suspects are being one case involves the DC FBI is now offering a hundred thousand dollars to see for the police are releasing marathon. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a true crime and paranormal podcast. First off, I want to say a happy new year. It's definitely been a very long break from Misty Mysteries, but I wanted to take some time to catch up writing some episodes and I was waiting on new recording equipment. So here's the hoping of the first episode of 2022 audio is a lot better than the last episode. This week, I wanted to cover a missing persons case that I believe deserves a lot more attention than it actually has. So for today, I'm taking you back to 1987 when 15 year old Alicia Markovich disappeared from her father's home. Alicia Bernice Markovich was born on February 20th, 1972 to a 14-year-old mother, Marcy, and father, John. Alicia lived in Winbur, Pennsylvania with her mother, Marcy, and Marcy's long-term boyfriend. When she was younger, Alicia's parents divorced and split custody of her. She lived with her mother and went to school in Winbur at Winbur High School, but visited her father, John, every other weekend and during the summer which seemed to be a pretty normal arrangement for many children of divorce around the 70s and the 80s. John lived in Blairsville, Pennsylvania, about 45 minutes away from Alicia and Marcy. Alicia seemed to be a pretty normal teenager. She was described as outgoing and pretty much friends with any person she met. She was a member of the track team at Winbur High School, and she was known to be a smart girl with good grades. When she hung out with her friends in Winbur, she would hang out on Grand Avenue, which today seems to be home of many shops, restaurants, and the Grand Midway Hotel that is rumored to be haunted. She would go to her high school basketball and football games and listen to what I would describe as glam rock, so bands such as Poison, Twisted Sister, Kiss, and Bon Jovi. Alicia didn't just have a good set of friends in Winbur, but she also had a boyfriend that her friends would say she got along with really well. He was a few years older than her, being 17 years old, but he and Alicia seemed to be just a normal, happy teen couple. She not only had a good group of friends and a boyfriend in Winbur that she knew most of her life, but she had two really good friends in Blairsville who she spent most of her time with when she was at her dad's house. One of these friends actually lived next door to her dad for a while when her father lived in a local trailer park before buying his home. This friend told people that she would argue with her father while visiting and she would go over to his house to spend time with him to get away from her dad. But Alicia wasn't the only person that would argue with her father, John. Marcy was in a legal battle with her ex-husband, John, over child support for Alicia. Marcy and John were set to go to court to have a child support hearing on April 29, 1987, to increase the monthly child support from $100 to $200. John was not happy about the $100 increase, which made Alicia worried about going to see her father that weekend. But Marcy told Alicia if he brought it up to tell him that this is a conversation for adults and to speak to Marcy about it, not her. John and Marcy never made it to court on April 29th because of what happened that weekend. But first, let's take a break and hear an ad from my sponsors, Anchor. Have you heard of Anchor? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. When I started Misty Mysteries, I didn't know where to go, and Anchor helped me get Misty Mysteries started without charging me an arm and a leg. Anchor is really my suggestion for anyone looking to start a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit in app or on the website. Anchor distributes your podcast on all the listening places such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, and all your favorite listening places. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place and best of all it's totally free on anchor fm and on the anchor app welcome back from the break and thank you to anchor for not only making misty mysteries possible but sponsoring the podcast each week let's jump into the weekend of april 26th the weekend before parents are going to go to court this weekend was set as her father's weekend to have alicia but he only got her for Sunday the 26th because on April 25th, Alicia attended a wedding of a family member on her mother Marcy's side. On the 26th, some report that Marcy drove Alicia to John's home in Blairsville, but in an interview I found from Unfound on YouTube with Lori Heiner, one of her best friends, 
and one of the people running the social medias to raise awareness to her case. She reports that John most likely picked Alicia up from Marcy's home in Winbur around 9.45 a.m. From who picked her up or dropped her off, we don't have a solid report. What Alicia's day looked like that day, aside from her father John's recollection of the events on April 26. John reports that he and Alicia spent most of the day at his home in Blairsville, but that seemed to be the most solid part of his story. His story has changed when he has spoken to multiple different newspapers about the day, but he either got in an argument with Alicia over her grades, her friends, or the child support hearing that was coming up that week. The argument reached a point between the time of 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. where John reports that Alicia stormed out of the home and he yelled to her that she needed to be home by 8 p.m. He most likely told her 8 p.m. since she was only 15 and he needed to take her back home that night to Winbur for school the next day. 8 p.m. rolled around and Alicia did not return back to John's home. He decided to search for her around Blairsville believing that she could be at her friend's house or in the downtown area. At this point, Marcy said she had been calling John's home phone since around noon with no answers. She had assumed that the two were spending time together, and since there weren't cell phones available like they are today, all she had to call was her home phone. Marcy went to bed around 9 p.m. that night and woke up to her phone ringing at 1 a.m. On the other end of the phone was John's voice telling Marcy that Alicia was gone and when she asked what he meant, he then explained that she left home and he now can't find her. Marcy went to the Blairsville Police Department and reported 15-year-old Alicia missing. The Blairsville Police Department treated her case as more of a runaway case than a missing persons case. They went to Winbur High School that day to speak to her friends and her boyfriend to see if she had been staying with any of them, but nothing came of it. During this questioning, they were also able to rule her boyfriend out as a suspect in her disappearance. John's home and property were also searched by the police with his permission, and nothing was found that could have made the police think of foul play. Marcy argued with the police that her daughter was not street smart and would not have run away, but the police leaned more on the side of her being a runaway. No moves or real searches were conducted for Alicia till three years later in 1990 when the Pennsylvania State Police announced that the investigators were now going to be looking at Alicia's disappearance as a homicide. Corporal Kurt Alleminger of the Indiana Barracks had this to say about Alicia's disappearance. Quote, Surely she would have turned up in three-year time period. The investigators believe Alicia Markovich was a victim of foul play. End quote. People don't just disappear, and if she did run away, it's hard to believe that after three years, she had made no contact with her parents or her friends or her boyfriend. There also seemed to be no activity on any bank accounts, leases, or any identification under the name of Alicia Markovich. The state police investigated any and all leads in Alicia's disappearance they could think of, but nothing came up or brought them any closer to finding her. Like with many of the cases I cover, It goes cold, till something happens, and for Alicia, this happened in 2000 when her father, John, received a letter from an anonymous person who claimed to have murdered Alicia. The anonymous letter gave coordinates to where her body could be found and contains a return address in New Hampshire. Investigators who looked into the letter drove 10 hours to New Bedford, New Hampshire, but the person at the address had no knowledge of the letter or Alicia. The investigators don't believe the person they spoke to is involved in Alicia's disappearance since they had never been to Blairsville, Pennsylvania. Their next step in the investigation of the letter was to bring cadaver dogs to the coordinates of the letter, which they never told the exact location, but they did admit it was somewhere near the river just outside Blairsville. But after days of searching, no hits were made by the cadaver dogs in this area. The letter has never been listed as a hoax, but none of the information contained in it seemed to help find Alicia, and the person who wrote the letter was never found. Alicia's case lost all leads and movement until 2011, when the state police announced they were going to be taking a fresh look at Alicia's disappearance. During the conference, they asked for anyone who knew Alicia or her family when she went missing to come forward and speak to them. They admitted they were essentially starting over and looking at her case as if it was a brand new case. They were interested in talking to people who were questioned in the past 
The investigators have not ruled anyone out since starting new, but have no potential suspects. It's hard without any proof that a crime occurred, which makes it hard for investigators to solve Alicia's case, but they do believe she most likely became a victim of a homicide shortly after going missing. Her body would be in the United States, maybe not even too far from Blairsville, but without a body or proof a crime occurred, they can't say for certain. Her mother, Marcy, has always believed something terrible happened to Alicia and believes the last person who would have seen her alive was the person who took her and possibly ended her life. Marcy has never accused or named anybody as a suspect. Alicia's father, John, on the other hand, has shared many different theories. When she first went missing, he believed she ran away and the police were very keen to believe him. As the years went by with no communication, he has shared a few other theories he believed happened to his daughter. John's home was not too far from a highway. He believed a truck driver or another driver on the highway that night may have picked her up while she was walking away from his home, and that person murdered her. At one point, he had also said that she may have been kidnapped, leaving his home and put into a human trafficking where she would have made the best of the situation, saying she would be covered in fur and jewels. Fingers have been pointed and theories have been made around Alicia's disappearance, from people suspecting her father, suspecting drivers on the highway, or even her getting into a bad situation with the elements that night. But at the end of the day, we don't know exactly what happened to Alicia. What we do know is her mother, Marcy, has never stopped and will never stop trying to bring her baby home. She has carefully saved baby teeth that she gave investigators in 2011 to use for DNA. The investigators used the teeth to put Alicia's DNA into a nationwide database that is used to compare her DNA to unidentified bodies throughout the states, but no matches have been made yet. In a 2011 press conference, Marcy told the press that Alicia's disappearance and possibly death has deeply affected her life and made her question her purpose in life. She always wanted to become a grandmother one day and she wanted to see Alicia grow into an adult, but this was taken from her the day she went missing. Marcy has come to terms that her daughter is most likely deceased, but hopes that her body can be brought home to bring her closure. Marcy, more than anything, wants to know exactly what happened to her baby and hopes that whoever took her or hurt her owns up to what they did so Alicia can get the justice she deserves. Alicia Markovich was 15 years old when she went missing in 1987. She was 5'2 and 120 pounds. She had brown hair, blue eyes. She was last seen wearing a white crop top with red, yellow, and blue stripes. She wore jeans and white sneakers. She didn't have any items on her except for purple sunglasses. Alicia now would be 49 years old. I will be sharing a recent age progress picture of her on my social media. If you have any information on where she is or anyone who may be involved or know something, please contact the Pennsylvania State Police Missing Person Unit at 724-357-1978. I want to thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you do like the podcast or would like to share some feedback, please let me know on my Misty Mystery social media accounts that you can find on my link tree. You can also stay updated on everything Misty Mysteries related on those accounts. Sharing the podcast and leaving five-star reviews are always welcomed. I want to remind everyone that Misty Mysteries does have a merch store and I have recently updated and added some new items. I can't wait for you to tune in next week for a very spooky episode that I have to say kind of scares me. Have a fantastic day and be kind out there.